Hi all, let's have another amazing aesthetic journey and experience by looking at 10 of the greatest sacrifices of Rashid Nezmeddinov. He is famous for assisting Tao in the latter's 1960 World Championship match against Mikhail Botvinnik. So I'll refer to him as Mikhail Tao's trainer in a way. He beat many of the world's top players. He was never awarded the GM title though, even though he won five Russian championships. He published an autobiography of his best games, entitled Asmandinov's Best Games of Chess. And, uh, you know, he played really out of this world chess. And one of the more famous videos on this channel is actually the positional queen uh, sacrifice game against Oleg Chernikov, played in Rostov, 1962. Let's have a look at this. Black had just played bishop f6 attacking the queen and I think theory at the time indicated this might be a bit drawish if black wants to draw uh, to kind of repeat this attack on the queen so maybe that you know black would be happy with a draw play with the white pieces you know the next round but uh, there was a bit of a shock here after this bishop f6 Esmendinov actually played queen takes f6 there's a detailed video about this game on the channel Petitional Queen Sacrifice which I urge you to check out. It damages Black's control of d5. It's really a positional Queen Sacrifice. Uh, you know the, the implications are just so vast here. So let's see what happened, how Black reacted. Black played actually Knight e2 check uh, which seems uh, logical enough. It actually distracts the Knight from d5. Uh, if Black had played e takes f, then bishop takes d4, and the knight's actually in a good position to get to d5 immediately. So at least black can do that little bit of damage to white's combination to distract the knight uh, from c3. So this knight e2 check, distracting the knight from d5. Now e takes. Okay, so one tempo gained at least. The knight goes back to head to that dangerous d5 square. So where is the compensation? Well, the thing is, black's kingside has been compromised with the absence of the dark square bishop. So getting the knight there and the bishop there could spell a little bit of trouble for black. Should black be able to defend this position though? This is very nearby what was a theoretical position with with repetition attack on the queen. Black tries rook e8 and we see now knight d5 and the idea of rook e8 is revealed rook e6. What's the big deal about this then? Isn't black a queen up? Bishop d4 and the king assists as well. So for a moment, it looks as though, is this really sound? Well now actually, after Rook AD1, engines are changing their tune about this position. Houdini 4 actually thinks now the position is about equal, even though white is a queen down. This is staggering. Uh, so black now played D6, Rook D3. More pressure is going to be exerted on F6. This bishop is a wonderful piece on D4. Has there ever been such a more magnificent bishop in the center, striking a very important square around the king? Bishop d7, rook f3, intensifying the focus on f6. Bishop b5. And now we see bishop c3 gaining a tempo on black's queen, kicking that back, her back. And in this position, we see now, instead of moving the rook, uh, if the rook had moved here, let's have a quick look. If the rook had moved here, black has rook c8 and threatens to ruin uh, white's position with rook takes c3 or bishop c4. The rook uh, would take away very important attacking resources which are needed. So Nezmetinov is very careful now at this point in the combination of the queen sacrifice, in inverted commas, to preserve these very important bishops without the rook coming in as a defensive role on the C file for either bishop C4 or rook takes C3. White plays knight takes F6. Now here this is getting pretty tricky to say the least. If rook takes F6 this is actually a clear advantage to white after rook D1. This nasty pin uh, is, is here and white uh, is, is actually doing really well here. For example bishop E8 Mike could just take that actually and get the queen back. That was a bit loud. And now take on d6 and white's in great shape, the exchange up. 
So here actually, after knight takes f6, black actually played uh, bishop e2. This might not be the most accurate defense in this position. I mean, it's difficult to, to find the most accurate defense. Rook c8 actually could be very useful for again that rook takes c3 idea. And here, white might have to bail out for a draw with knight e8 double check. Bishop takes e6. And it, it looks very, very scary. But uh, maybe even if black you know, puts the king here, this could be a draw this position. So maybe a slight blunder now after this knight takes f6. Black actually played bishop e2. And now white's attack rages on actually. Knight takes h7 check. So we're kind of opening up line on the h file potentially. King g8, rook h3. And you see now that there's great coordination of that bishop and the rook potentially for rook h8 mating at some point. Can black just aim to eliminate the bishop, you might ask, with rook c8? In the game rook e5 was played, if we try and eliminate the bishop with rook c8 here, I'm not sure this does it now. Knight g5 has another implication to it. In that rook takes c3, there's rook h8 check as a, as a drag and drop tactic to winning the queen. And white would actually be better here in this position. White's better. So this rook h3 is really quite dangerous now because of knight g5 and rook h8, even if the bishop zapped with rook c8. But black tries rook e5 trying to blunt this diagonal. Here we see f4. The pawns play an important role now. Bishop takes f1. And in this position, actually, technically, uh, there's there's two very good moves. One of them was played. Knight g5 might actually be a very good move as well as what was played. But king takes f1 as well. Guarantees white a very strong position here. This is very precarious for black. Rook c8. Trying to grab this bishop. So if f takes e again, the fun spoiler might be this. But actually, in this position, it doesn't spoil that much fun after knight f6 check. Because we're going to have rook h8 winning the queen. Or here, we've got a mate in two, actually, like this. So it's not a fun spoiler anymore in this position uh, to play rook c, um, to play bishop, to play rook take c3, pardon me. But the bishop was actually preserved with bishop d4. And now black played b5. And now we see knight g5, so this idea of rook h8 is emerging again. Rook c7 was played. And we see that combination kind of reflected now in any case after bishop takes f7. Uh, black is in big trouble here because of this rook h8 tactic. If king uh, g7, this doesn't really help black, knight e6 check. And because of that's pinned, we're actually winning the queen. That's massive advantage for white. Black plays rook takes f7. And now this rook h8 check, this drag and drop tactic for this amazing fork comes through here. So king takes, knight takes f7 check. Knight takes d8. And white has two pieces for the rook. It's a significant enough advantage here. Knight c6, doesn't matter about the f4 pawn. And here, black recognizes he's losing uh, without too much counterplay and resigned. So it was an absolutely spectacular positional queen sacrifice after this bishop f6. And I think what was before, you know, fairly beaten territory. So amazing uh, that this, this conception is so powerful here. I'll definitely check out the detailed video on that game, the positional queen sacrifice. Let's now go to the game in 1958, four years earlier actually. The Zmetanov was playing black against Lev Polgiavsky, and this is a highly celebrated position. Uh, Zmetanov just played knight b4, and here we saw rook h1. Okay, what does black actually want to do in this position? If black plays a normal move like queen g2, this doesn't bode very well actually. 
Off the rook takes h6. Okay, there's a check. The king can go to d2 though. And then what? What will be happening here? I think uh, black is in big trouble. The bishop can now go to d4 here. And this is all falling apart pretty soon for black. After knight c3, the fun's been taken out of the attack. And actually, black's king is now in trouble soon. After the queen takes bishop e3. Uh, massive advantage for white. So clearly, this is, this is not acceptable. This is just not an acceptable continuation. And black finds something else after rook h1. Black actually plays rook takes f4. So we've got this mighty double check opportunity at least, at minimum, from bishop and rook if rook takes queen. Now if g takes um well let's let's rook takes queen was actually the move played. Let's have a quick look at g takes. Here bishop takes f4 check uh is very good. The knight is actually an attacking piece over here for c2. Knight takes f4, there's knight takes c2. It's amazing how it's not just about the king, it's about other pieces on the other side of the board even being you know attacked. So knight takes c2 actually wins, unfortunately for white in this particular configuration. White's queen, white would have to give up the queen, and there's not much for white to do here. So that's not acceptable for white. So after rook takes f4, white actually accepted this um, double check. So rook f3 double check, and the king steps to d4. And it's not usually a good idea to take your king for a walk, but uh, you know, black is without his queen. He's just sacrificed his queen. Um, bishop g7. Okay, and there's numerous threats. This this is annotated in detail on the channel as well. This game, if you if you look for it. Um, so, black is threatening uh, things like knight takes c2 now. Uh, white plays <clears throat> a4. And we see now c5 check, actually one of the more accurate moves after d takes, b takes. The threat is now c5 mating the white king because actually the knight is controlling that d5 square. We see now bishop d3, which protects at least the c3 square has made a safe haven to c5 check. So if c5 check was played, King c3 is, is possible, but still black would be better actually. This is very precarious position to be in. Black now actually played knight e takes d3 check, so it's the discovered check on the king. King c4, now the pawns play a role, d5 check. After e d c takes d5, king ventures to b5, check, king a5, knight c6, check. And it's going to be mate. White had to resign because if he plays king a6, then there's rook b6 mate, as well as other mates in one actually knight c5 or knight b4. Okay, so that was pretty spectacular as well as queen sacrifices go. After this knight b4, it's like this provocation to play this rook h1, which actually kind of carries with it a weakness of the last move. It's not defending f3. And that's really tapped into dramatically with this rook takes f4. So even seemingly allowing a skewer, seemingly allowing this dangerous thing, but uh, this rook takes f4 uh, is just enormously powerful here. Uh, so amazing stuff. Let's go now to 1961 to the USSR Championship of 1961, played in Baku, the homeland of Garry Kasparov. And Nesmetinov was playing Mikhail Tal. He was white this game against Mikhail Tal. And it looks as though, you know, maybe you could argue, well, has white been a bit reckless here with his pawns? Tal plays bishop g7. Okay, there's some f file pressure at the moment. Is it really much to speak of? The knight seems to be very nicely placed for controlling dark squares. Black's pieces seem okay, but uh, what is black going to do about his king safety with this knight on h6? He's going to have to castle queenside. So given, given if white plays a single normal move in this position, I think white is in trouble. 
and we know that from tell sacrifices that sometimes a normal move is just not acceptable. A normal move like bishop e3, castle queenside, what's the problem for black? He's controlling dark squares very well, it's actually going to be a small advantage for black. g5, we've got a very excellent retort here, to knight f4, where h6 is actually a vulnerable piece, and black can end up you know, better. So actually in this position we see instead rook takes f6 which does set tell a lot of new problems in the position of the bishop takes f6 knight d5 hitting the queen trying to open up this e file to the king perhaps best is to actually take this though so after e takes check this might have been potentially uh, a reasonable continuation but white still um, stands quite well here after bishop e3 so anyway so knight d5 we see queen d8 and now this pressure on the f file is replaced with the queen coming to f2 hitting f6 knight f4 knight takes f pardon me knight takes f4 seems so that might be an idea, but actually bishop takes f4. After e takes, now we see with the king in the center, stuck in the center literally because that knight's stopping it, we see white trying to open lines with e5. Now, this might have been Mikhail Tao's last chance in this position to do something. Uh, technically, bishop h4 seems like a, an idea here. It seems quite scary after queen d4 though. Rook f8. Rook d1. It seems a very scary position for black to play, but maybe, maybe it's okay here. The engines indicate it might be okay for black, about equal. <laughs> but it just looks like a scary position to play. Uh, so if, between humans, this looks very scary. So anyway, after e5, actually Mikhail Tal, he played something which um, does look a little bit risky, to be honest, to open up this e file instead of bishop h4. So rook e1. So that bishop's pinned f6. But how to exploit this e file? Maybe Tao uh, underestimated, uh, didn't, didn't quite see this continuation. Maybe. Uh, so white play played actually the shattering. Well, can you guess? If I give you 10 seconds, or you might want to pause the video. Okay, knight takes f6. So here we have queen takes f6, and the idea is not bishop takes b7. This is the clever. This is the really clever point because black actually in this position might actually be able to play king f8, and it's you know giving up the rook is is actually no big deal actually because the bishop d4 immediately skewing the queen, so white can't even take that rook. Queen C C five check again. This 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 might need no big deal, and White's opportunity is gone. Really, no. Forget taking the bishop. This is the key point here. Queen D four. Put pressure on E five. This maintains an advantage, significant advantage in the position. King F eight. Rook takes E five. Now threatens all sorts of things like Rook F five to try and win the queen. Queen d8. Now rook f5 check was played here. So Tal is getting smashed now. This looks incredibly dangerous. Where did he go wrong? If we just rewind for one moment here, it's already a smashed position. This position actually, it's pretty smashed. So let's continue. Rook f5, g takes, queen takes h8, king e7, queen g7, king e6. G takes f5, the knight supports that as well. And here, black resigned, Mikhail Tao resigned. So I think Tao found someone whose style he could admire and be his trainer for the 1960 World Championship match the year before, actually. But this is, uh, yeah, 1961 here. Tao destroyed here in this game. If he continues with king d6, knight f7 wins the queen. 
Okay, a pretty devastating game just from some F foul pressure and the king, you know, was just a little bit caught in the centre. And rook takes f6 really does just emphasise a lot of the dangers in black's position. Uh, I guess Tal must have maybe regretted not playing bishop h4 here. It's a much safer move actually than this e file in principle. Sometimes as humans we, we need to like stick to principles in very complex positions. Uh, but the concrete punishment was quite remarkable. Because I think Tal had been expecting to give up his bishop and rook to, for some sort of dark square counterattack. Now let's go to in 1951 to Kasparov's homeland, Baku, 1951. There's Metanov playing with the black pieces here. And <clears throat> actually a bit uh, similar in principle that black wants to sometimes give up his queen side for, for a king side attack. There's a very interesting first move here. It looks as though the queen side's under a bit of scrutiny. White's been playing positionally, it, it seems. Andre Liffenfall. And black just reacts to sort of backfire this stuff against white's king by playing the move b5. Sorry, after c, white plays c5 here. If, if white had taken on b7, I think that's, that's okay for white. Uh, but white plays c5. And now knight takes b7 will be even more powerful without dropping the c-pawn. And with support, that past c-pawn is dangerous. So after c5, it looks as though there's difficulties. But black actually played b5, offering an exchange sack. Uh, white now is in a bit of a problem, actually. Doesn't matter what he does. This, this looks as though this is potentially a bad position. Uh, if knight b2, for example, d takes c5, what is white doing? He can't play b takes because of the knight. If he takes here, then queen takes is actually very pleasant for black with bishop takes h3 on the cards, among other stuff. So anyway, in the game, c takes b en passant was played to this b5, a takes b. And now white does take this exchange, this exchange sacrifice. Queen takes a8, but it's with tempo now, knight takes b6. Surely it's with tempo hitting the queen. This is okay. There's no time for bishop h3. Well, queen at a6 hits the knight. The knight goes back. And now we get bishop takes h3. The rook goes to c1. Just white is offering that exchange. And here, we see really powerful play again at this stage. Black actually damages white's light square control by playing d3, trying to puncture this f3 square in particular, in particular trying to get this pawn away from f3. e takes d3, queen a8, beautiful move. So black is now threatening as well as mating one, things like knight f3 check, but mating one's the, the principal threat. f3. Now, Black's attack really is powerful now with this next move. Can you guess it if I give you 10 seconds or you might want to pause the video? Okay. Knight g4 introduces bishop d4 check, among other things. Knight c4 is played. I mean, what what else is there though? This is a very very difficult position, indeed. Uh, so let's go with the game continuation. Bishop d4 check, and here, a really incisive move. Indeed, actually, it's the engine's top choice. It introduces uh, some new attacking possibilities for the queen here. Queen d5 introduces ideas of queen h5 in many variations. We see rook c2. And now bishop takes f1. And white has to resign here. This queen h5 is really crushing. Uh, for example, if queen takes, we just play queen h5. King g2, which interrupts the rook. Queen h2 is mate. So what a way to react violently to an apparent, you know, queenside pressure. 
just using the queen side to get white's king with this very energetic b5. Kind of reminiscent of one of Fisher's sacrifices where he, he sacrificed um, like this to get rid of uh, Fianchetto bishop. Let's go to Kazan in 1936. This is a very young Nesmetinov. Who was also, by the way, a Czechist so, champion. And as Metsnov was black here and played in a very violent, aggressive manner, getting these aggressive pawns with his rook on h6. And he continues aggressively with, after bishop e3, which is supported by the knight on c2, he continues very aggressively, uh, not caring about his bishop actually on c5. He goes with g4, just new opportunities. For the queen here, rook takes h2, queen h4 check, you know, can win, win the knight minimum. So he doesn't really care about this bishop hanging on c5. Bishop takes c5. Now that minimalist combination is actually avoided here. Black doesn't just go to, to win that knight because, well, he's, he's giving up a rook to win the knight. Is it that clear, this position? It might just be a perpetual check after, you know, check here. I think mean, we're just we're just getting a perpetual check. He doesn't want a perpetual check. No. He plays queen h4. We see bishop g1. And he's got his piece back now without sacrificing the rook. And now threatening mate. Much better way of playing it. Knight e1, trying to defend the mate. <clears throat> and here, perhaps technically strongest apparently is queen h4. He plays actually bishop d5. I'm not sure white plays the optimal defense here. White plays b4. We see knight h5. Bishop f2. The queen goes to f4 here. This is uncomfortably being eyed by a lot of pieces, h2. f takes g4. I think this is the fatal mistake, allowing a forced mate. White should, in theory, play queen c1, it seems. And black is still better, mu uh, quite a bit better, with, say, a move like g3. You know, if takes, it takes f4. And, you know, there's trouble on e2 here. That was black's best shot, queen c1, but it's a difficult position. Sorry, white's best shot. f takes g4 was played. An acute forcing mates now. Very, very cute actually, as cute forcing mates go. Can you spot it? Can you see the whole lot? If I give you 10 seconds here, you might want to pause the video. Okay, queen takes h2 check. After king takes, we see knight g3 check. Now if king g1, then there's just rook h1. So the king is brought out here. And now f4 is check mate. So that was Kozalopov, actually. I should have said if I didn't. Kozalopov <laughs> uh, in Kazan, the op um, open 1936. Now let's go even earlier, even earlier to 1929. There's Metsnov playing black here in one of my favourite Vienna games as white. So, and it, it's sometimes a bit suspect this plan of Queen e2 to come to b5 that we might have seen earlier in the channel. Uh, sometimes, if black can play dynamically and uses queenside as bait, and he does so in this position because black now just played bishop g4, not caring about this apparent weakness of the last move. Because really, the queen side is there just to be given away for a good attack in this in this Metanov's hands. Queen b5 check, seemingly exploiting that, pedantically winning a pawn. c6, queen takes b7. But what about the rook? Isn't that a problem? Bishop takes f3 was played. And white now takes the rook. Okay, he's won an exchange. And he might have underestimated Black's next move here, though. I think Black is technically uh, better in this position. 
and apparently could could even castle, but this next move is more spectacular. Bishop takes g2, making sure that queen h4 check is without g3, knocking out the g pawn. White blunders now horrifically. White's best and only move, it seems, is bishop takes g2. So after check, this might not be uh, a forced mate. After king d1, no, that is pretty bad for black actually. King e2 apparently might be okay, just about. So check king d1, and white will be okay there. But no, white really blundered here with bishop e2, and this is just a forced mate in five actually. Quite pretty though. Queen h4 check, knight f2 check, and we've got a nice smothered mate combination after knight d3 double check. And you guessed it here, I hope. Queen e1, yeah, for the smothered mate, knight f2. So that was back in 1929. Let's go back now forward to 1957 against Yuri Kotkov in the RSFSR Championship. Krasnodar, USSR 1957. Now, black had been trying to play quite a solid opening and reach this position, but white does control that e file. As Metodov playing white played knight d5. Black now played f5. And okay, this this does weaken this, this diagonal as well. It's not usually a, a move you'd want to play as black. Um, and we see a spectacular conception though. Knight takes c7. So queen takes, queen d5 check, king h8. So the idea is revealed that the queen over here is not just support, it's not, it's not just neglected e7, also e8. So rook e8 now. And white is actually threatening things like queen f7. And because there'll be that pin, you know, rook takes and bishop b2 will be deadly. So black tries here, knight f6. White's doing really well. Rook takes f8, bishop takes f8. Bishop b2 pinning that knight, bishop g7. And it's really quite incisive here, the play for white. Bishop c4 threatens mate. Queen, um, no, no, it doesn't threaten mate like that, pardon me. <laughs> it threatens mate with rook e8 check. And then after uh, bishop f8, then queen g8 mate. So that's that's the immediate threat, this mate in two with uh, rook e8 check. To get basically that pin back on the knight for queen g8 to be threatened. Black is in serious trouble. He played bishop d7. And we see now bishop takes f6. Bishop takes f6, queen f7. How does black defend f6? He tried queen d8. But now a beautiful final move here. Can you see it? If I give you 10 seconds, you might want to pause the video. Okay, rook e8 check. So Black had to resign here. If queen takes, we just play queen takes f6 mate. And if bishop takes, that interrupts the first rank. So we just play queen f8 or queen g8 for that matter. Now let's go to a simultaneous display, believe it or not, in 1951. Kazan, USSR. There's Metinov playing white. He just played bishop takes c6, offering the rook here. Black more cautiously played rook d8 for the moment. Now queen b3 was played. As Matinov is crying, take my rook, take my rook. And this is taken. Bishop b2, queen b1. Attacking e4 potentially, so um, if the bishop's not, not protecting e4 at some point, then that could be useful. But uh, as Matinov says, basically take my other rook, knight f3. Take both of them. So queen takes h1. And we get this pleasant position for white. With a kind of free hand for the moment with the queen out of the picture. 
So he plays knight e5. Threat. Queen takes f7 mating. Parried e6. Bishop takes d7. Rook takes d7. It's pretty forced now. Rook, queen, pardon me, queen b8 check. Now here, if king e7, there's knight c6 checkmate because the bishop controls f6. So we see rook d8. But now, queen b5 check, king e7. Queen b7 check, very delicate checks, but f7 is a big problem. King f6. Queen takes f7, and the king has to come out to play. Knight f3 check is played here. Now, if the king tries to step backwards, then I think just queen f4 check will do for mating two. You know, queen f4, g5, queen g5. So the king cannot step backwards. King h5. And now, pawns play a role. g4 check after king takes. Queen takes e6 check. King f4. Bishop e5 check. King takes e4 and pretty knight g5 checkmate here. So that was a symbol. That's why I find that especially impressive to to do this stuff in a simultaneous display. Okay, let's go to 1969 now against Timeyev as black as Metanov playing black. This isn't the soundest of the puzzles I'm showing you, the puzzle positions. His queen side is under scrutiny again uh, from these Fincher bishops. These cause a lot of problems sometimes to the queen side. And black's move, you might think, is a little bit surprising initially. Uh, but the logic of it is the queen really needs to feed off dark square points in white's position here, like h4 g3 you know if the queen can get onto dark squares then this pawn is more effective and we see actually black trying to get onto dark squares by offering up his queen side with the move h6 and white is technically better here white played bishop takes b7 which might not be the best um i think black could have actually simply played taking rook d8 and this dark square point, this is actually quite dangerous uh, for white here. Uh, we see a little bit more uh, dynamic, aggressive g5 offering a rook. So it wasn't, it wasn't actually necessary. We could have weakened the, the light square, so we're just taking a rook d8 with, with good compensation, actually. But anyway, let's, let's follow this. After g takes f4, Black is following this logical plan of weakening the dark squares though. G takes f4 and we see that h4 is now a bit looser. The h4 square. Bishop e6. Okay, attacking the bishop and the queen. The queen comes to protect with queen b7. Technically white is doing okay here, doing quite well. Bishop c4. Okay, this needs to be parried. This mate threat. Queen takes e2 sorry mate in four fret because then f1 etc so queen e4 defending e2 and then we see that you know that dark square campaign queen d8 trying to get into that h4 which had been undermined earlier king g2 f5 queen c6 this might not be the best move here, actually, queen c6, just queen f3. It looks as though white white is standing better here. Um, king h7. And Esmetanov is a bit lucky here, because <laughs> white played actually uh, king f3, kind of blowing his position totally. He had a reasonable position to play with here. It looks a little bit dangerous in practice. But actually, apparently, queen f3 is, is okay to play in this position. So say bishop takes d4. Uh, white has resources here. It, it looks incredibly dangerous, this position, actually, to be fair, with knight e3 check on the cards, etc. 
but engines suggest this position is actually after bishop d4 okay because there's an there's a kind of engine generated move bishop e4 which is like a, a cold shower for black and and his attack here uh, knight e3 check we can actually just take that because we've got the pin that's that's not a problem here um, so white uh, after bishop e4 this this is a real pain to celebrate that pin and threaten things like queen takes g4 uh, but no thankfully Finn's better off actually white played king f3 uh, which goes into a forced mate now <laughs> basically uh, black to play what does black play if I gave you 10 seconds starting from now you might want to pause the video okay the clue is you you want to open up some more dark squares actually first okay if you went all in with Queen h4 that's not the way because white's better with rook h1 no first give up the pawn it opens up the f2 square the pawn vacates the f2 square after rook takes f1 queen h4 is incredibly much more powerful now because of you know rook h1 we've got queen f2 now thanks to that pawn vacating so here actually um i think after queen h4 white actually resigned in this position it's forced mate in three uh, if king g2 we play the check and then actually we play bishop takes e2 mate for example there's also queen h3 mate so yeah he was a bit, a bit lucky there but i think it's important to show you know that sometimes players with black are on the brink of queenside collapse uh you know technically okay that there, there was actually another way of playing this without being so so dramatic uh just taking on b7 is actually um is actually good for weakening the light squares as well and continuing uh, the dark square campaign with g5 trying to you know undermine white dark squares but anyway an entertaining uh, finish now last one i want to show you from 1931 only back in 1931 in the category one and two tournament so there's metanov playing black played c takes d4 white played e takes d4 and initially does there look to be enough to justify a sacrifice on c3 which does seem to be asking for it on this c file i think the beautiful thing about this is how the, the queen on on f3 becomes a target in this combination black played knight takes c3 after takes rook takes c3 check so king b1 so Fm Korchmore was playing white here and maybe had underestimated this position and there's because there's queen a3 now which threatens uh, things like rook takes d3 so white's kind of blocked that but now and it's the only it's a really good move to really give black an advantage here although black might not even need it apparently black might be even slightly better with a move like a5 here believe it or not but the really incisive move is to celebrate the queen over here so it's not just about the king these combinations bishop a6 exploiting the queen's position and gaining a very very important attacking tempo for the king so using the queen as an excuse to get to the king because white has to defend the bishop taking a move and now we see bishop c4 pressure on on the king again white is in big big trouble here he tries knight c1 and now we see rook takes c1 forcing mate after rook takes c1 Queen takes a2, mate. I thought that was pretty neat how the queen's position was exploited there. I hope you enjoyed this little tour of Nesmetinov's uh, sacrifices, 10 of his amazing sacrifices. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.